Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Quran Weekly, this is Yusha Evans. And uh, inshallah, this is for our, especially our new Muslims, even for anyone interested in Islam, to understand what are the five pillars of Islam in a concise manner that will give you, inshallah, some bit of detail on each and every single pillar because the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that Islam is bent, built upon five things. Uh, the first of that five being the Shahada, first and foremost. Uh, to come to Islam, you must testify to La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The first pillar is actually the entry point into Islam, where one is bearing witness of a belief in the heart. Because uh, the Shahada begins with the belief inside of the heart. One must believe within themselves that there is nothing that is worthy of worship except the one true creator of all that exists. That is the first and foremost point. You must believe within inside of yourself there is nothing that has the right to be worshipped except the one true creator of all that exists. And number two, we must believe inside of ourselves that Muhammad وسلم, is indeed the prophet and messenger of Allah, the one true creator of all that exists. And he is the last and final messenger in a great line of messengers and we believe in all of them. And when one takes the shahada, one is simply bearing witness to that which they believe in their hearts. They are simply saying with their tongue that which they believe in their hearts. So they would bear witness that there nothing has the right to be worshipped except the one true God, Allah. And they bear witness that Muhammad is indeed the messenger of Allah. This is the entry point into Islam. This is the first pillar to, to, uh, of Islam. And for our new Muslims, you have taken this step uh, recently, most likely. And this is your beginning point, is to understand this shahada. Uh, this pillar needs to be understood very well. We need to understand what it is we are making a witness to. When I say, Ashadu in la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah, I need to know what it is that I am saying. I need to understand within myself that I am giving a testimony that I will not worship anything except the one true creator of all that exists. I will not give my worship to anything else. I don't give my obedience when it comes to affairs that belong to the creator to anything else. My servitude is for my creator alone. Uh, my deeds are for my creator alone, etc. This, this has to be understood within the context of, of the shahada. And when I say Muhammad Rasulullah, I have to understand that I am bearing witness not only of the prophethood and messengership of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but I am bearing witness to obey him. I am bearing witness that he is my messenger, that what he says I will do and what he prohibits I will stay away from. This is part of understanding the shahada. It is not just a testimony by the tongue. It is a testimony by the tongue of a belief in the heart that is enacted through the limbs. And this is the beginning point of Iman. There was once a great man named Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah. He was a scholar of the, the Tabi'i, the people who followed the companions. And he used to say that Iman is not the substance of hopes and desires, but Iman is something which settles in your heart and then becomes manifest through your actions. So the first point I want you to realize about your shahada is not only must you believe it and witness to it, but you need to start living by it. This is something that we must as Muslims live by each and every single day. All of my actions must be coordinated around my belief of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and I try to act within those parameters, insha'Allah. Now, after one enters into Islam with the first pillar, the shahada, the next thing that becomes obligatory upon them is the second pillar, which is the salah, the, uh, the ritual act of worship. And I don't necessarily like to give it the, the interpretation or the um, definition of prayer. I don't like to call salah prayer because salah is much more than praying. Salah is a ritual act of worship that is given to the Creator. <clears throat> salah means a connection. It is a connection between you and your Creator. This is the foremost action of your testimony of faith. Allah says in the Quran, uh, that I didn't create mankind and jinn but to worship me. And this is one of the primary acts that we show our Creator that we are serious about our shahada is that we do the five legislated 
salah each and every single day. We do not miss them. This is something that we take of as a serious uh, issue of importance. And this is something that is very, very paramount for new Muslims. Learn your salah. Learn your connection between your Creator. Because it is your salah which is going to be a testimony of your faith. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said that when every single person is resurrected, they will not move their feet from their standing place until they are questioned about a certain number of things. And the first thing that they will be questioned about <coughs> is their salah. The first thing that each and every single one of you will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment will be your salah. And the Prophet وسلم, said, if your salah is in order, then everything that follows it will be in order. But if your salah is not in order, you have been lazy about your salah, you didn't take it seriously, you didn't pray with sincerity, you didn't pray on time, you missed salah. If your salah is not in order, then everything else will be out of order. So this is very important. Our salah is so, 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 so important. It is so important and this is one of the miracles of Islam as well, one of the miracles of the Prophet wasallam. But it also shows us the importance of salah, that salah was legislated by Allah bringing the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and is what is known as his Isra al-Miraj, when Allah took the Prophet ﷺ in one night from Mecca to Jerusalem, and then ascended him up into the heavens, where he had a private one-on-one -on -one conversation with Allah. And it was during that private conversation where Allah Azawajal legislated the Salah at fixed times for the believers. This is the importance that Allah had on Salah, that He brought the Prophet ﷺ all the way to the presence of Himself alone in order to legislate and mandate this beautiful act of worship that we have in Islam. And when one takes this act of worship seriously, it goes on to affect every other part of your life. When you take Salah seriously, it affects every part of your life. Because Allah also says in the Quran, <clears throat> Establish the salah for indeed the salah will prevent you from evil and bad sinful actions. So when you pray the salah with sincerity, it goes on to affect the rest of your life. It becomes a barrier between you and your evils. Now, along with the salah, and we see these two things attached very heavily in the Quran uh, with the third pillar of Islam, which would be the zakat or the uh, um, uh, the, the charity tax, you could say, you could give it a, a pure definition. These salah and the zakat you see attached to each other heavily in the Quran. Uh, the zakat is something that not a lot of new Muslims know about and not a lot of even Muslims who have been Muslim all their lives even understand zakat whatsoever. So this is something that needs to be understood completely in its context and it will take time for everyone to understand zakah properly. This is why we have scholars uh, and things of that nature and zakah calculators and all of these different things. But zakah is simply, in the general circumstance, it is 2.5% of your annual savings. Of your annual savings. That means that if you have money that you set aside, you have a savings account or a savings piggy bank or whatever it is, you save a certain amount of money, let's say you save a thousand dollars on the side and you have that thousand dollars saved for one lunar year, lunar year according to the lunar calendar. After that lunar year passes then 2.5 percent of that must be given to the poor. And there are also categories of people who are eligible for zakat and a lot of people are frightened by zakat because they don't understand it. They'll think, oh my goodness, I barely make enough money to pay my bills. How am I going to give 2.5 percent of my money away? Number one, if you do not have savings for one period of for the over the period of a lunar year zakat is not uh, obligatory upon you you don't have to pay zakat um, but number two if you do have it that 2.5 percent you give is actually a means of purification for your wealth and actually it is a means of, of of increase zakat also means increase it increases your wealth it is a uh, an assurator from allah to increase your wealth it is an ibadah in and of itself to give the mandated zakat it helps the poor, it helps the needy, it helps the wayfarer, it helps the traveler who has lost his place. It goes for the, the helping of the building of masajid and da'wah and things of that nature. And then it helps you personally. So zakat is a pillar in Islam. It is a pivotal part of Islam. And zakat is one thing, subhanAllah, that if the world understood the realities of zakat, we would live in a much better place. 
because if you look at the statistics, let's just say of America, one of the most affluent countries in the world, where 10% of the population owns 90% of the wealth, if those 10% of people who own 90% of the wealth paid zakah just once, they could realistically help about every impoverished country throughout the world. They would be able to facilitate almost every single impoverished country in the world to get back to a place of stability and, and, and uh, um, sustaining, being able to sustain themselves. And, and that's very sad when we look at the world today and we see the man-made and the man-created famines all over the world going on in, in Asia and in Africa and, and in other places we realized that if zakah was something that was instituted as a, uh, a legislated uh, um, act within any single society that, that we would see so much benefit. But unfortunately this is a reality that is not even understood amongst most of the Muslims. So we need to bring about this understanding of zakah, which is the third pillar of Islam, uh, insha'Allah. Now the fourth pillar of Islam, which is also closely connected to the uh, other two, Salah and Zakah, is Siyam or fasting. And when we refer to fasting within the pillars of Islam, it means fasting the month of Ramadan, the lunar month of Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan. Fasting is described as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, uh, um, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا قُوتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السَّيَامَ قَامَ قُوتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ That fasting was prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who are, came before you so that you may obtain taqwa. It is something that Allah has commanded in Surah Al-Baqarah uh, that we fast. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam legislated and told us that the fasting is for the month of Ramadan. From the beginning, the first of Ramadan until the end of Ramadan, from the time of Fajr, when the sun actually begins to, to uh, show some shade in the, in the sky and the actual legislated uh, um, timing for the beginning of fasting is when the Prophet Sallallahu said when you can distinguish a white thread from a black thread that means you can see the difference because there's a, a light that is starting to appear in the sky this means that it is time to begin your fast and this is the appointed time for Fajr to come in as well so at that point the Muslim is forbidden from three things they are forbidden from eating any type of intaking of any type of food any type of sustenance even if it's a, a intravenous type of feeding, this also would break the fast. Uh, um, but there are things that need to be understood as that as well. So there's no eating, no intaking of any food or nutrients, can't take vitamins and nothing. Nothing enters into the body by way of food or drink and also the relations that take place between married uh, couples. There is no sexual relations, no eating, no drinking from the time of Fajr, from when sun begins to rise and until the time of Maghrib, when Maghrib comes in. That means when the sun has set past the horizon. From these two time points, we do not take in any of uh, food, drink or physical relations with our spouses. And this is something that is very clear. There is no difference of opinion about this. Uh, the things that I would encourage uh, our new Muslims and all Muslims in general to understand is the issue of uh, uh, um, permissibility in Islam when it comes to issues of rukhsa. When Allah Azawajal gives us a permissibility, for instance, because a lot of people uh, question about things such as a diabetics, which is diabetes, is, is a big problem that is uh, suffering, uh, people are facing all over the world, especially uh, a lot of the Muslim ummah uh, suffering with diabetes. And someone will say, well, I need to take an insulin shot. I'm, I'm legislated two to three times a day. You should understand those things if they apply to you, because there is a rukhsa, there is a permissibility for that issue within a need. If you have a need for something, Allah Azawajal understands the needs. If you have a medical condition that prevents you from fasting and that actually would harm you because of fasting, then the wisdom and the hukum of Allah Azawajal as the one who legislated these things is that you should abstain from fasting. If it will harm you physically, then Allah Azawajal actually it is more righteous that you do not fast and it is more righteous that you take care of yourself because Islam is a deen that is legislated by the creator of all human beings and of all things and therefore he understands his creation and he knows that his legislations have to fit within human boundaries as Allah Azawajal says in the Quran fear me as much as you are able to do so and what you are not able to do so, then there is the area where Allah Azawajal is Ghafur Rahim. He is the most forgiving, the most merciful. 
So fasting is from the beginning of the month of Ramadan, when the moon is sighted for the month of Ramadan, until the moon is, is uh, um, sighted at the end of the month, and it is from Fajr until Maghrib, very simply for this case. Now, moving on to the last pillar of Islam, uh, which is the Hajj uh, or the pilgrimage. The Hajj is a pillar of Islam that is obligatory on each and every single individual who has the capacity to do so. And that needs to be understood. Who has the capacity to do so. And that really needs to be understood in the light of the increasing expense uh, just to make this last pillar possible. Uh, the Hajj is the pilgrimage to the house of Allah in Mecca, um, in the blessed uh, lands of uh, Jazirat al-Arab. And it is a reenactment of some things that took place long, long ago. When we visit the Kaaba in Mecca, the Kaaba in Mecca was built uh, uh, by the Prophet Ibrahim salam upon the foundations set by the first human being Adam salam and his son Ishmael and some of the things that we do of circumambulating around the Kaaba and the running between Safa and Marwa is a reenacting of Ishmael's mother uh, running and searching for water etc stoning the Jamarat is when Ibrahim salam was you know uh, pushing back the shaitan when he was being tempted to sacrifice his son etc all of them have a deep meaning behind them which you should learn and and, and that you should know before going to Hajj but going to Hajj is only during Hajj season during Hajj begins in the month, it's, it's in the month of Dhul Hijjah, uh, the month of Hajj, and it takes place at the same time every single year in the lunar month of Dhul Hijjah, and it is obligatory on someone who can afford it. If you can afford it, then go to Hajj. If you cannot afford it, then it is not obligatory upon you. It is not obligatory upon you till you can afford to do so, inshaAllah ta'ala. And we hope that everyone at some point in their life is afforded this opportunity to go to Hajj and to see the Kaaba and to go to uh, Medina insha'Allah ta'ala and visit uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Insha'Allah hopefully this has given you some concise uh, summary of what the five pillars of Islam are but do not take this as a compendium. Know that the pillars of Islam are deep they are uh, um, intricate in their understandings and there are very, very deep things that need to be understood starting with the very basics of the Shahada all the way up into the rites of Hajj. So please consult with someone in your locality, in your local area, your local Imam if there are classes going on, etc. to gain some more knowledge because knowledge only increases you in your faith uh, and faith eventually increases into certainty. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah about the benefits of those who have certainty. So inshallah, I look forward to speaking with all of you again. Uh, this is Yusha Evans for Quran Weekly saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.